So the uh, data, data is a problem. How do you know if the data you're using adds value? We're living in a world now where the amount of data is doubling about every two years, about every two years. That means that since about 2013, we have created more data than our entire species had for the millions of years before then. The past two years, more data than everything else before. So we're living in a world where we have to decide what data is important. And how can you tell that if someone gives you, you're getting flooded with new data all the time. How do you know if it's interesting, if it's important, if it's adding value? It's a difficult question because data by itself doesn't answer any, anything. It doesn't tell you anything. You have to combine it with some kind of smarts, some kind of analytics, some kind of insight to figure it out. So if I give one smart guy one data set, another smart guy a different data set, they might both reach the same conclusion even if their data sets are different. So how can you, you have to standardize somehow about the smarts, right? You want to split the world into two, give one smart guy one data set, and then this, and a clone, give him the same data set plus something else. And if he can do more with it, then you know it's more valuable, right? That's, there's no other way to really tell. Um, in our example, in the world of sports, we have an opportunity to do something better. We can actually test to see in certain cases if we can make money, um, right? If, if we have excellent strong, healthy wagering markets. If using some kind of data gives you more ability to make money than using a regular kind of data, that's an indication that it's more valuable data. So let me show you the, the bottom line. Um, this is the, this is the graph. Um, to, in order to, the basic idea is this. If, how are we gonna standardize the intelligence that's applied to the data? Well, instead of using human learning, let's use machine learning. We'll use machine learning with one batch of data and machine learning with another batch of data, the augmented data. And if this stuff does better in predicting and making money in wagering markets, then that's useful. Then you know something is useful. And this is a general, so I'm gonna give you the specifics about what we did with our data, but this is a general technique that might be useful for you in, to figure out if your data is useful. Now when you see a graph like this, the orange goes up and makes money, the blue goes down and loses money, the blue is using publicly available data. So Vantage Sports, we are in the business of making uh, new unique data sets and new tools and our primary product is uh, for the NBA. Our clients include NBA teams, players like Carmelo Anthony, uh, agents, media. Um, uh, some of the stuff we'll track, which I'll tell you more about, like you know, is a hand up on every single shot take and all sorts of uh, unique information. If we just use regular publicly available NBA data, including optical data, and you bet on that last year, you lose a lot of money. If you use our data, uh, you make a lot of money. Now when you see a graph like this, you have one of two emotions. The most common emotion is just pure unfiltered rage. You're angry. You, you, know, you must have done something wrong. You, you, can't, you can't do this. You, know, you must have used the test and the trial period. must have been the same. You didn't do rolling. You used, you're skewing. You're, you're playing with the axes. You're doing all sorts of stuff. That's the usual reaction you would get. And after you go through all those things, no, we didn't do test and training. It, you know, everything was clear and kosher, and we'll go through some of that. Then the only remaining emotion to feel is jubilation. The heavens have opened. You know, the answer is here. We know the data works. This is great. So let's take a step back. Focus the more general question on data. Data, you know, data versus information, what's the difference? Now in the field of knowledge management, there's a typical, a, a standard answer to this question. There are gray areas, there are gray areas, the difference between data and information. Think to yourself, how would you define data? How would you define information? What's the difference? The typical way of thinking about that, and I like this from a particular blog, because it has a nice example. Data is a raw number or a word. It's something you'd store in a database. It's a specific thing. So for example, uh, there's a color red at a certain coordinates. Fine, right? You, your eye sees a particular pixel. That's a piece of data. By itself, it doesn't have any meaning. Information takes collections of data and provides meaning from it. So there's lots of different red lights coming, but they're all, all of those reds are on a particular traffic light at a particular intersection facing in a particular direction. Right, this traffic light right over here has turned red. That's information, right? That's different from raw data. Raw data is just the pixel value. Okay, but then we can go even higher. Beyond information, there's knowledge. And the knowledge adds context to the meaning. Uh, not just this particular traffic light, but this is the traffic light that I'm driving towards. I'm driving towards this traffic. It has turned red. That's knowledge. Now I've applied it, contextualized it. To me, it's an interactive thing. I get it. And finally, the top of the pyramid is wisdom. Wisdom incorporates, is applied knowledge, but also applied correctly. Okay, so I know I'm about to, the traffic light has turned red. I better stop the car. That's wisdom. I could have made a different decision. I could have said, you know, let's gun it. 
that's not wisdom because you're not using the correct decision, right? You're going to die or whatever. So this is the typical approach to data. How does this apply in sports? So and specifically in the NBA. Um, there's different data sources out there. There's the traditional data sources, which is the box score. It looks like a box has a table, points, rebounds, assists, and so on. Then there's also play by play. Let's lump all those together. How much data is there? So the file size, if you were to download for a single game, it's about 25K, very small, right? It's about 100 rows, because there's about 100 things that happen in the play by play. And there's about 700 data points, roughly. That's what we learn from the regular, of standard, traditional box score stuff. The information, so the data points are pretty small. It's a very small number of data points, but each one of them is, is important, right? The, the knowledge and the information that comes out on them is not small. The information is actually medium. Like, how many points did a guy score? 20 points, that means something. It's not just there's a red light in a particular pixel. It, it has information. That's valuable. Now, the knowledge that comes out of it is given all of those pieces of information, the points and the rebounds, the plus minuses, can you create something useful? And people do and have created many useful metrics from this kind of information. Uh, there's uh, you know, various plus minus metrics, there's the PER, there's win shares, win score, all sorts of different stuff that create value, that measure performance um, from the box score stuff. OK, that's box score stuff. Now recently, we've of course had the sport view, the optical data, uh, which for many years I thought was the most amazing achievement of all humanity. And then uh, last year when I presented about uh, optical data, and I, I said this is the crowning achievement of humanity, um, afterwards someone came up to me and said, have you heard of Vantage Sports? And I hadn't. So now I'd like to revise my earlier statement. Um, Vantage Sports is the crowning achievement of humanity. So uh, optical data, a, a typical file size for one game is about 40 megabytes. That's huge. That's much larger. Right, 25K, 100 rows, all that stuff fits into Excel. You can put multiple seasons into Excel. This, you can't fit in a single quarter into an Excel spreadsheet. This is large. There's about 100,000 rows. There's about 2 million data points because it tracks 10 players. Uh, so 10 times 100,000 is a million. And each of them attracts the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, right? How far along the court are you and how far up the court? So you have about 2 million data points. But that's it. That's all you have. You don't have, it doesn't tell you where there was a pick. It doesn't tell you where their, where their hand was up. It doesn't tell you a lot of stuff, but it does tell you the X and Y. So the information content is actually relatively low. The information from that, piece, that source of data is relatively low. You can generate, you can do a lot of work to generate knowledge from it. And it's fun work. It's a lot of machine learning, right? You have to figure out, was this a pick based on all the stuff that I've seen? It's difficult, complicated, interesting, intriguing work, but it's a lot of it to get to the final result, the final ba actionable basketball information. Now, Vantage Sports comes in. We're somewhere in the middle. Our file size is only half a meg, so yeah, it's bigger than play-by-play, -play, but much smaller than optical. We only have about 3,000 rows, which is reasonable. We have 16,000 data points, which compared to 700 is large, but compared to 2 million is nothing. But that data is very high in information. We track, for example, whether a hand is up on defense for every single field goal attempt for last year, for every single team, for every single player. No one else has that. That's pretty important stuff. A coach, you start playing basketball at any age, they're going to tell you, put your hand up on defense. Well, who does it? Who does it better? That's a true contested measure if your shot was contested. Not just whether you were within three or four feet. If I'm within three or four feet of Kevin Garnett, who cares? Right? What's, he's going to laugh. But if I have a hand up, then I'm going to stop him, of course, of course. Um, so, uh, so the information is high, and the knowledge that we can create from that is, is higher still. So the funny thing is all that work that I used to do, which was I really enjoyed getting the medium level of knowledge from optical data, that turns out to be a subset of what Vantage now provides as information. This is just for context purposes. We don't get all of the pick and rolls, all the screens. We track every single screen and all the four players involved. Who was, it? was there a slip? Did he use the screen? Did he go the other way? Was there a hard show or a soft show? All stop, every cut, every drive, everything that happens, that comes out as direct information, not something that has to be interpreted and machine learned and done a lot of work with. Okay. Uh, our process, how do we work? We have um, the game starts, we record the video, we slice that up into chunks, we throw it out to our analysts, to our uh, full-time trained analysts. Um, it's not crowdsourced or anything. These are employees. Uh, when they make a mistake, it, you know, they get fired. They, this is legitimate work for them. Um, and we have multiple analysts for each team. Uh, for each game, and uh, we cross-validate. So obviously, if there's a screen, we have four players tracking that particular thing, and if they're off, you know, it's all cross-validated. It's, it's cleaned, and it's almost in real time. We end within about, usually within about an hour after the game ends, we already have the stats for that full game with all the screens that happened, all the contested, everything. That's the process. 
Let me give you an example. So this is a video that was produced by ESPN using our data. It was, a, I don't know, something like a two or five second clip of one particular game, and you can see how much data really happens. Let's watch. True Hoop TV, the art and science of the playmaker. Cavaliers at Hawks, early March. Jeff Teague's man, Kyrie Irving, gets stuck on an Al Horford screen. Kyrie's been struggling with this all year. Teague splits the defenders, creating a major advantage for the Hawks. Teague's first choice is to attack the rim. But Kevin Love, one of the NBA's most effective help defenders, rushes over to stop that. This sets up the killer moment. Now it's on Teague to make the play. As soon as I get in the paint, I think we got him. The choices are good ones. Kyle Korver is deadly from the right corner, maybe the best in NBA history. Normally, J.R. Smith would be sliding into the paint to help prevent Teague's drive. Instead, he's determined to take Korver out of the play, making the pass nearly impossible. Kyle Korver is usually face guarded the whole game, so usually me and my teammates are playing four on four on the floor. T could shoot a floater over Kevin Love, or dish to a trailing Horford, but Teague sees something better. LeBron James trying to guard both Paul Millsap and Damari Carroll at the same time, and like Korver, Carroll can shoot the threes. I tried to look off LeBron like I was going to pass it to Damari Carroll. But LeBron's really good at playing the passing lane, so we have to try to do no look passes or look away to, just to get him off balance. Teague knows LeBron James gets shooters rattled. Teague gets LeBron leaning towards Carroll and away from Millsap, creating the perfect opportunity, an uncontested reverse layup. You react. Uh, I just react Paul was wide open. It was only the right play to drop it off to Paul for an easy layup. And that's how it's done. Two, three seconds, whatever was the total play. Here's the data that we ha we collected for that, uh, expressed in English language. So we have Teague received a screen at the top of the, did he use the screen? Yes. Did he split? Yes. Uh, Kyrie Irving was the screen defender. Uh, what was, where was the location at the top of the key? What was the screen outcome? Mozgov was there. Uh, uh, he was an on-ball screen setter by the offensive player uh, on the defensive side. Was he split? Yes, he was. Teague drives, Horford sets another screen. Did he receive the ball? No. Was the screen effort? He rerouted the defender. Kevin Love came in with the help. There was a double team. There was a keep in front situation. Uh, Love, uh, uh, the shot defense was pressured, the shooter was this, the shot clock was this, and more. The uh, Millsap had a pre-acquisition action. He had a shot attempt. Was it off the backboard? Yes. All, tons of information. Right? This is information. This is very usable, actionable stuff. And you saw it. You saw all of those things happen. How does this appear in the box score? Millsap layup shot made, assist Teague. You missed everything. Right? All of that interesting stuff that happened, you missed everything. So, that, so that's the justification to think that maybe our data might help. Right? You have to have some justification. It's not just random data. Uh, this is a visual representation of how much additional data we have. So this is all our data, but some of our data is the box score equivalent. Right? Did the guy score? Did he get a rebound? Was there an assist? Some of that is equivalent to what you would find in the box score. That was, those are the blue dots. I made the blue dots bigger because there's so few of them. You wouldn't see it otherwise. Orange is what else we track. The screens, the drives, the closeouts, the contests, everything. Um, pressure, stuff that the human eye can see, but it's really hard for a computer to be able to distinguish. And you can see most of the box score stuff is, happens in in the paint area, right? That's where most of the rebounds, the points, that's where it happens. But we have a ton of stuff everywhere else. Obviously, a screen can happen at anywhere, and there's a lot of information there. Um, this is all for the, the NBA Finals. A, a rough indication. You can see where the interesting information is coming from. This is a timeline of just one game. So the, one of these points, I don't know which one, one of these is just the jump ball. And there's, maybe there was another one, I don't know. Uh, so it never happens again. And then this is a timeline. This is where the different events happen and different pieces of information come out. You can see there is some blue. Yeah, some of the box score stuff happens. But the overwhelming majority, like 90% of the stuff, is non-box score information, just within a, a specific game. OK. So. The basic idea, we'll take an NBA data set, including optical data, including optical data, throw that into machine learning, and then augment it with our vantage data, throw that into the same machine learning algorithm, roll it, train it, you know, keep it clean, do it the correct way, and see if, if there's a difference, if there's a difference, if one of them works, if one of them doesn't. If both of them work, 
then you know, we don't need our data. Let's just start betting using NBA public data, right? If neither of them work, it's possible we might still have some explanatory power or use in other areas. That's possible. So this isn't a, if it doesn't work, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But if it does work, if it works with our data but not with the NBA data, then that's a really conclusive proof. So what is the data that we used from the NBA? This is not just points and rebounds. It has all of that too, but it's also the scheduling. What were the, how many games did each, uh, each team play the last five games? Was this a back-to-back? -back? How many rest days? Who were the referees? All the regular stuff like points, second chance points off, turnovers, uh, the largest lead, free throw rate, all that stuff. So what portion of your points came from two-pointers versus three-pointers? Uh, ratios like the, the offensive rating, the uh, contested percentage, uncontested percentage measured by, um, not truly contested, but by the optical. In addition, we have the optical, we have hum distance, total distance run, the uh, offensive rebound chances, defensive rebound chances, the touches, the secondary assists, the free throw assists, the total number of passes and assists, um, the contested, uncontested, and defended at the rim field goal makes an attempt. So it's a ton of data, and this is using all of the publicly available optical stats. This could be huge, right, if this works. That's about 50 different metrics. We add to that in our second data set, the augmented data set, our vantage data. Our data has stuff that, of course, no one else has, things like the contested field goal percentage. When, you are, when the hand is up in your face, how well do you shoot? Uh, how open are you, your open plus frequency? When, how often are you open? Obviously, if you can get open shots, you, you want to hit them. And how often do you hit them? Your open plus field goal percentage. Your points per chance. A chance is a single, continuous, uninterrupted offensive opportunity. Um, that's, that's just scoring. Then there's seven other possibilities. The shot defense, what was your points against per shot? Your overall movement, how efficient are you on cutting? Uh, when, you're, when you're blocking a guy, do you tend to keep him in front or do you, uh, do you throw him off the line? Do you, uh, on turnovers, XY data and uh, box score, obviously, if you committed a turnover, how do you know if you were in the air? Every coach will tell you, don't go in the air without a plan, right? But who tracks that? We track that. If you, for every turnover, we know whether you were in the air at the time that the turnover was committed. So we have that as a percentage, the number of turnovers that were unforced, which to a human eye, you can see if a turnover was unforced. But if you're trying to extract that from the raw data, it's a really difficult question. It can be done, but it's, I'm not even sure it can be done, but it's certainly a difficult question. I know raising your hand is impossible, and the in-air percentage is impossible. The data is just not there. Uh, how effective your bump percentage was, your front post D, your, your passing rates, your assist plus screen percentage. All sorts of, of course, the rebounding of block Outs. Did you block out? Did you have an opportunity to get a rebound? Did you change areas to go to a different uh, to get a rebound? Uh, did you receive and set screens? How many per chance do you set and, and receive screens? Uh, w when you get a screen, did you split it? Did you set a solid screen? Right? How can you tell that from anything else? Other? Well, a human can tell. He either stood his ground or he didn't. We have that data. And there's many more. The keep in front percentage on a, on a screen. Did you hedge? Did you do a hard show? What percentage of the time did you hedge versus dropping back? Okay, so we throw that in there, cross our fingers, and see what happens. And this is, and it, it works, it works, it works. What does it work? So we have one year of data, the first 50 days or so we use as training, and after that we roll. Um, uh, so, okay, so machine learning. What machine learning algorithm do you use? There's tons of them. Do you use random forest? Do you use support vector machines? What do you use to try to beat um, the, the vantage? By the way, we're trying to, not the, the Vegas closing lines. Those are the hardest ones to beat. You can sometimes beat the opening lines, but the closing ones are the hardest one to beat. So we make ourselves a hard threshold, and it turns out to work. So here we're betting. We start with $5,000, presuming uh, our, our bankroll. You bet 1% per game with a minimum $10 bet. Uh, and you're betting to win $10 versus losing $11, right? So even if you're just tossing a coin, which is basically what the NBA data does, you're going to lose money because you're losing more, your, you're paying more on your losses than you're collecting on your wins. What machine learning algorithm? Um, you could use several. Uh, I think in this case, the best example to use is deep learning. Deep learning is a relatively new and hot machine learning technique. If you haven't heard about it, it does really cool things like figuring out if you're looking at images of cats online. It can figure out what a cat is. Um, what a dog is, who you are. If you use Google Photos, I'm pretty sure they use deep learning. You can search for people's faces and it does, it's awesome. Um, the way deep learning works is very similar to the way a human brain works, which is no one knows why it works. And secondly, th there's hierarchies. So uh, the first level is just a regular neural net, but then you have uh, hi several orders so you can extract structure. So if you're thinking about image processing for deep learning, the first layer is trying to understand reds and greens and maybe basic shapes, but then it's trying to combine the shapes into certain things and combine those into other. And that's kind of the way the brain works. Um, and deep learning has had a lot of successes. And one of the successes, now we can add to the list, is uh, Advantage data sports. So, um, using uh, uh, so 
we, we train, we roll. Um, there's no um, there's no cherry picking. There's no bias here. I'm not fiddling with the axes. It's literally the case, and here's some stats, that our model, you win about 54% of the games you play. The break even is 52.38%, right? You have to win 10 out of, you have to win 11 out of 21. Um, Whereas with the NBA data, it's about 49% of the time you win. 49% is within the standard error of being 50%. I mean, it's a little worse than a coin toss, which is okay. And you end up, you start with $5,000, you end with $1,700. That's not a good investment strategy. But uh, from, from Vantage, it, it works, right? And this is the, the bottom line, it works. And so, so that's the specific for our case. But again, to generalize, if you in general, you're being inundated with data, and you don't know if it's valuable. In some cases, you're lucky and you have uh, some kind of wagering market that you can use to figure out if you're adding value. What's beneficial about our field, sports analytics, is that that's usually a very healthy market and it's not very efficient. This may or may not work in finance. Right? Because if you have additional data set and you're trying to predict the direction of a market, like the S&P 500, it's, it's hard. Right? They're just, it just may be too efficient. If you're just predicting coin tosses, I don't care what data you have, you're not going to be able to predict the next coin toss. But in our world, we have this available tool, and I think we should try to use it as much as we can. Thank you very much. I'm almost certain that that will engender some questions. Can we, can we go back to the Cleveland-Atlanta game? Uh, how do you define, so at the end of, the, at the end of all of that, yeah. it's Jeff Teague dropping off the Millsap and there's a contested shot against Kevin Love. What, what does your system do in terms of assigning some accountability to, to uh, Kyrie Irving? It's a great question. Um, right now, so that, the way I would think about that is our system provides the information. To answer that question would require some knowledge. So without our information, you can't answer that question. With our information and work, you can. Um, by the way, this is not a contested shot because he, he didn't have his hand particularly up right there. It was a pressured shot, which we distinguish hand up or hand down. Um, uh, so for an accountability question, you would use the information for a particular thing that you're trying to look for to see what they should have done. So on top of this, you might want to build a model to see what decision he should have made. Right? Kind of like a ghost player or something to see what should have been done and look at all of the situations where that happened, which we can quickly do, and see how often he made the correct decision versus the incorrect decision. Sometimes it could be that the incorrect decision actually pays off more and substantially more. Right? So maybe that the model is incorrect. So there's, there's no way to answer that question unless you have a model of his correct behavior, if that makes sense. Like sometimes it's obvious, like a turnover. Right? But sometimes it's not so clear. Should he head? Should he not head? Should he, should he keep him in front or should he work on someone else? Um, but those are the kinds of questions that we'd love to be able to answer. Now we have the capacity to answer them. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> no, and here's the reason why. Because I work in the NBA, and everybody kind of has the same, all you services that everybody's trying to do is somewhat the same thing. We all differentiate a little bit, but everybody has the same issue. So at the end of it, it's field goal attempt against Kevin Love. Semantics or whatever. It says field goal attempt against Kevin Love. So. At the, at the root of it, Kyrie Irving causes the problem. Right. And all Kevin Love's trying to do is solve the problem. Correct. Okay? So Kevin Love, to me, shouldn't even be a part of the equation. Agreed. He's just trying to solve a problem that one of his teammates caused. Right. So at the end of the day, Kevin Love, while a porous defender, was just really trying to do the right thing. Agreed. I agree completely, 100%. That's why. So field goal attempt against Kevin Love, right? Well, that's in there, but it also includes that he was helping. Right? It's not that he was the primary man. So if you, you obviously want to exclude that. If you're looking at Kevin Love to decide if he's a good defensive player, you can answer it with much better precision now. For example, in the video it showed, we see that he's the number two defender in the league in terms of helping out. That's not something you would get with your eyes, and that's certainly not something you get with any other data set. But with ours, we can. Kyrie Irving, we see that he, uh, uh, he didn't keep the guy in front. It was a switch. Right? You can look at every single screen that he was involved with and see what happened as a result of that. As a result of this screen outcome, there was an assist. That's a failure, right? Boom. And we have this data. You don't even get to Kevin Love until later. So we, in our case, it's not the case that this was a field goal attempt against Kevin Love. That comes from the box score. That maybe comes from optical. That doesn't come from Vantage. Yeah, I, I would argue that it wasn't a switch. I would argue it was a switch because Irving made a mistake. Yes. Right? They switched because they had to switch. And you have... 
I mean, it's, it's not a it's not a switch per se. Like they didn't go. The, the game plan wasn't to switch. The game plan was to do something different, and they had to switch for preserving these stuff. But then you would filter by that first piece that said this is what happens when Kyrie Irving makes a mistake, and then you're looking at what happens on a switch. So you could look at switches after people made mistakes, or switches after they make mistakes. I think the point is whatever question you want to get to, you can boil it down to that question. And so all those little things we're talking about are definitely concerns. They're actually more concerns than the other day because normal day you could never break it down and figure out what you want to figure out. Does, did Ken answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. You Okay. I, I agree with you. I think that there's an additional step, which is to make this useful to a coach. I agree with that. And they're, they're, you know, that's part of the work. Uh, but at least you have the information now to get there. And many questions that a coach has have are quickly answerable. And what makes it nice is... But the, but the nice thing is the questions, the, you don't just want to ask a question and get an answer a year later, right? You want to ask a question, get an immediate answer, then ask another question. That's what our information allows you to do. No, coach is a way to hear. It's not a problem. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I had a question. Uh, you said the NBA has about 50 metrics, and then you guys add about 75 other metrics. I was just curious, how do you decide which metrics to add, which metrics are important? Um, but, yeah. so, uh, okay, so we have all of our metrics. Everything we do is independent of the NBA. We don't use the play-by-play. -play. We don't use anything because the play-by-play -play has mistakes, and we don't want mistakes. We train our people not to make mistakes. We think our data is much cleaner. That said, I wanted to create a, a, a horse race environment where we're comparing. We wanted, I want to give as much advantage as possible to the uh, publicly available data set as, as I can. So I'd use everything from the NBA data set, everything I could find, all, including the optical-related stuff, the distance run, the offensive touches, the scoring, everything. Um, and then on top of that, I add basically all of our Vantage stuff. So the next question would be, uh, can you filter it down? Maybe there's just one or two things that are really the most important items in order to make money. That would be a separate research project, and that's something that you could look at. Uh, but as a general rule, so when you're doing that, it, this technique may not apply. But the technique of using machine learning on one data set and another data set versus a, a market-oriented Vegas lines or something else to see if someone makes money or not, uh, that applies more on this broader context where you can add it. So machine learning, you know, um, it does a really good job. It's not like linear regression. It, it, it's very hard to overfit with machine. It, it'll tell you what's important, what's not important, kind of decides it for itself. Okay. Additional questions? Are you using only your eyes when you're watching the games, or are you using like sports view data or anything else that you might have? No sport view data, just uh, very highly trained eyeballs. Are you just in basketball for now, or are you branching out to other sports? We're currently just in basketball. We're on the verge of branching out to other sports. Last chance in the full form. So to follow up on what Clay said, when you say very trained eyeballs watching, watching the game, it, you know, what Clay wanted to know is, or, or what he said, Kyrie made a mistake. Who is going to watch that and know that he made a mistake outside of potentially the Hawk staff right. or Cleveland staff right. so that it's coded correctly? Right. So uh, our, I should have said the highly trained analysts don't, they're trained to find objectively uh, quantified data. So we're trying to tag objective stuff. We don't want anything subjective. I think he made a mistake. You think, let's take a vote. No. Uh, so what we're going to tag is this was a screen. This was a, uh, did he use it or not use it? Did he split? Where was the location of the screen? What, was, what happened before? What happened after? So as much information as possible. Um, it's, it's not tagging uh, a subjective view of mistake. Sure. Except, sorry, except with some cases like unforced turnovers, 
where it's, it is pretty objective if somebody made a mistake, right? They dribble off their foot, you know, whatever. Okay, I think we're close to time. A nice round of applause Thank for you. the presentation.